so much for joining us on this extremely sunny Sunday. I'm Elizabeth Brent. I'm part of the University of Cambridge Development and Alumni Relations Department. And I'm delighted to be here today with Professor Ezra Ozurek, who's the Sultan Qaboos Professor of Abrahamic Faiths and Shared Values and Academic Director of Cambridge Interfaith Programme. And with Dr. Shruti Kathila, University Lecturer in History, and Professor Hans van der Ben, who's Professor of Modern Chinese History. Together, they're some of the leading thinkers behind Cambridge's new Global Humanities Initiative, which is working to bring a global perspective into the mainstream teaching and research agendas for the humanities across the institution. I'm going to pass over to them now as they discuss the legacies of empire in the Middle East, India and China. Hey, hi. Hi. Um, I Hello, everybody. First. I think, Ezra, you were going first, right? Yes, yes. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Beth, for this introduction. Okay. Although the age of empires came to an end more than a century ago, the fascination about them continues at an increasing rate. Some glorify their military, architectural, and scientific accomplishments and feel proud of what their ancestors accomplished. Some are angry at them for the exploitation and suffering they caused and feel guilty and ashamed. How are we going to remember and commemorate the empires that had fallen? The truth is, empires were not one thing, but all were good, bad, and ugly. They all owe their achievements to forceful extraction of any resources, including humans, from their territories. It is those extra resources they bring to the center that give them the ability to build remarkable buildings, support impressive artwork, make major discoveries and scientific achievements. It is almost 100 years after the Ottoman Empire that rules territories on three continents across Asia, Europe and Africa came to an end. Today's Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, Albania, Bosnia, Croatia, Hungary, Macedonia, Romania, Cyprus, Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Azerbaijan, either in their entirety or in part, once formed the Ottoman territory. So what is left to these countries and others from the Ottomans? What is the legacy of the Ottomans today? Were they the beacon of tolerance and coexistence when Europeans were relentlessly murdering their religious minorities? Or were they the barbarians who forcefully converted people by the sword and committed arguably the very first genocide? To whom does all its glorious glories and failures belong now? Was it simply a Turkish empire, a Muslim one? Can all these nation states that followed the Ottoman Empire, and especially Turkey, built at its epicenter, claim the glory for the past accomplishments of the Ottomans? Is Turkey responsible for the crimes committed and the suffering caused by the Ottomans? The questions we ask for other empires are hotly debated in post-Ottoman territories as well. In this new, newly published book, Ottomans, Khans, Caesars, and Caliphs, Mark David Baird describes in detail how Ottomans were built on Turkish, Mongolian, Islamic, and Byzantine heritage. The Ottoman rulers were Muslims who adopted Islam shortly after they came to Anatolia in the 11th century, but they saw themselves as the successors of the Roman Empire. Like the Romans, their aim was to conquer territories and also make and execute laws with which to rule these large territories. Like Romans and many other empires, their entire aim was to extract resources from these territories and use these means to support the center of the empire. Empires that control vast territories and extract resources from them, by definition, do not care about or not able to devote resources to hom homogenize them. This would be practically impossible and also irrelevant to the raison d'etre of the empires. 
homogenization and creation of loyal subjects is a project for nation states. Like the Roman Empire, Ottomans were a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious empire that stretched across three continents. Constantinople, the capital of Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, served as the Ottoman capital for five centuries. The most unique and underappreciated reality Ottomans left to us is that the East and the West, Asia and Europe, Islam and Christianity are not or have not always been opposites, that they live compatibly, integrally, even if in conflict for six centuries. When we consider Ottomans as a continuation of the Ottoman Empire, sorry, as of the Roman Empire, as the Ottomans themselves argued, we gain a different picture. We understand that Ottomans did not develop as a parallel force and in competition to Europeans, but as part of it. Ottomans were part and parcel of the major European accomplishments, such as the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Age of Discovery, the Enlightenment, the scientific discovery, the religious tolerance and secularism, but also other developments, what is considered major European inventions, such as absolutism, slavery, world wars, and genocide. Physical, linguistic, religious, and bureaucratic remains of the Ottomans live in territories they once ruled. Also the remnants of a multilingual, multi-religious, multi-ethnic past is also alive in Turkey, in a Turkey that no longer adheres to such a multiplicity. If we look carefully, the Ottoman legacy and legacy of most empires is that the reality was always complicated, not good, not bad, but sometimes beautiful, and a lot of times ugly. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, is it me or Hans? I forgot. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ezra, for that. Uh, because uh, after the Ottomans, um, you know, the greatest as it were, clash or the decline or their fall came from the world's most powerful empire, modern empire, which was the, the British Empire. So I'm going to say a little bit about that and also take you to India where I'm sitting. So this is greetings from Delhi, uh, where I'm sitting very close to what is called the Central Vista, which the British built as a massive architectural monumentality to empire. And as I speak, it's now being dug up and remade uh, in the light of India today and a new kind of architectural identity is going to be given to Modi's India as we speak. So empires, power, monumentality and its expression have been uh, with us uh, for actually millennia, but there is something quite unique, I'm going to argue about the British, and they are the exception in the history of empires, both in their making, but also in their unmaking. So uh, we would all know, uh, us in Cambridge would know, that there's a very big building uh, named after Seeley, who was a historian in the 19th century, who first wrote a, a very kind of evocative uh, piece on British empire, but soon after, at the, towards the end of the 19th century, he, there was a kind of turn away from empire within Britain itself. And I'm thinking about the kind of now forgotten, uh, also political economist historian Hobson, who had actually argued that the story of empire, as Ezra also pointed out, is related to the experience of economic extraction, but particularly what later came to be known or today in our time is called capitalism a very different form of revenue extraction and, and empire making. So the thing that Hobson, and that was followed and made famous uh, soon after that by Lenin, uh, the, the architect of the Russian revolution, who in a way is the person who uh, invents, the, not invents, and kind of persuades the world to say, while empire has always been there, in, in whether it is the Russian Empire, whether it's the Mughals, whether it's the Ottomans, whether it's the Qings, um, empires are no longer, particularly European empires, are, are no longer legitimate uh, political entities. I think this is the first, in a way, international 
critique you get of empire. There were critiques that were developing in nationalist movements and identity movements. But this was a real first big, along with Hobson, a treatment. So what marks my point is that there's a departure in the early 20th century in human affairs when actually politically it became unsustainable to be call yourself an empire. And this is why, though we might live in the age of American supremacy, uh, what is known to us in the last 110, 20 years is that there might be something called American imperialism, but there is no such thing as self-confessedly uh, as American empire. So that changes, and this is partly because of the British experience itself. The British are key to the story of this exceptionalism, but also the demise of empire as a legitimate political entity. And this was because I take you back uh, to someone I'm incredibly fond of, and that is India's first prime minister, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. So we cast yourself back to the Second World War. Uh, this is the 19, early 1940s. And the, the Indian effort had always been uh, ma you know, maximalist for the British uh, war effort. And it's uh, Churchill had, of course, uh, the hero of the Second World War. Uh, both of them went to Harrow. Uh, both of them were also Cambridge products. Uh, uh, but K Churchill had actually uh, uh, put all the Indian political leadership in prison precisely to kind of contain the anti-imperial mobilization that was going on. In his prison sentence, uh, of course, uh, as the last Englishman to rule, uh, in the, uh, in, uh, uh, to rule India, as Nehru would say about himself, uh, he did a lot of gardening, but he also wrote a, a lot, a big bestseller called The Discovery of India. It is a book which is uh, written in captivity, but it also marks out, it tells the story of India over two millennium, but he actually says, well, of course, India is a great civilization, it's a big territory, it's continental, but it is also, as we know, uh, for at least a millennium, if not more, uh, has always had empires which came from the so-called outside whether it was the Mongols, uh, whether it was the Mughals, whether it was even the earlier sort of so-called slave dynasty in the 13th century, 12th, 13th century. Um, Nehru's point was a simple one, that India has been pretty accommodative or has lived with foreignness and, and the like, and has, has, been, has seen a large number of empires. But what, 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 what the story was, that it was the British who had a different relationship to India. So in the, the British experience in India was the exception to the story, partly because, as Linda Colley in her work shows, this is the first national empire. That is to say that the British, the British Empire controlled overseas territories, including the jewel of the crown, India, but it had no loyalty to the local people. The loyalty belonged to another nation. And therefore, the age of the nation state and the age of nationalism is also the age of the British Empire. As a result, its greatest legacy, good, bad, ugly, uh, you know, we know that today you cannot escape either uh, the newspaper, a magazine, certainly not Twitter, and not come across kind of highly polarized debates around race, around the legacy of slavery, ar ar around what it means to be British, what Britain owes, what are, what are reparations. Uh, this is not the the argument is not my argument is not that it's the same thing everywhere. Overnight, when India got free on the, uh, in in 1947, of course, it was a very a bloody, a fratricidal transition. Um, the the kind of the monuments to the to, to the statutory to British uh, colonels or oppressors even were pensioned off, they were quietly moved out of the city squares and they were put outside, you know, left to pasture outside, outside cities. So in, in some ways, someone like Churchill in India, everyone knows that he was sort of responsible for the Bengal famine, that this was not a man who was pro-Indian independence, but he doesn't cause the kind of visceral identification pro or anti in the way in which he tends to animate discussions in Britain. This is to say the legacy of empire, even the same empire, is remarkably different, is very differently remembered in different places. So I would say that the, the British empire has, in a way, been, I wouldn't say suited or done with in India, but yes, 70 years on, on uh, this is not to say that people have forgotten the British, but there is a way in which the country has 
is more in a kind of hyper nationalist mood, uh, does not really, really care that much about the British Empire. It is, in that sense, the credit must go to Nehru because all the generation before him, like people like Gandhi, who actually decided to think about the future of India itself. So in, th in some ways, they, though they, some of them wrote history, what they were trying to do for people like India, the Indians was to actually free them from a past that had oppressed them. So I think the debates around empire are necessarily debates about history. They're also debates about identity, but they're also debates, therefore, which contain questions of violence, which we cannot talk about just now. But I would say that the final legacy that I see very prominently with the British story is, of course, the story of the nation states, which were cast anew, whether it's Africa, Middle East, the entire world is made into a modular world of nation states. And wherever the British left, they were bloody fratricidal partitions because these maps were also not simply just a drawing of line, but the lines, but they also were causing new forms of identification, new forms of intimacies, and new forms of externality. And I think for that reason, the British Empire is going to continue to animate uh, us for some long time, even though it is now nearly a century, uh, it's nearly you know, dead for more than 70 years. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to begin by saying that I am speaking to you from Holland, from Leiden, uh, where I did my undergraduate career. That's one explanation for the empty bookshelves you see behind me. Uh, but it is also intellectually been very interesting for me, uh, because one of the questions I've been interested in is in the Dutch Empire. Uh, and I just want to underscore something that Shruti just said. Um, the British discussion about empire is much more intense and complicated uh, than the one that is taking place in this country. It happens, of course, there are various government involvements and so on, but it really isn't capturing the public imagination or dividing people. Um, there's a sort of a settled view of, yeah, we were on the wrong side of history, but you know, let's move on from it. That has to do with the Dutch experience in the war itself, uh, the history of occupation being on the good or the bad side. Uh, it's that kind of perspective. But I'm not here to you, I'm not here today to talk about the Netherlands or the Netherlands East Indies, although perhaps a slight reminder that it was the third largest empire in the world at the time of the Second World War. It may not go amiss, but I'm talking about the Qing Dynasty and its legacies. Um, that, that legacy was brought home to me personally when I first went to China in 1987, uh, which was at the time of the filming of Bertolucci's film, The Last Emperor. This was my first time in Beijing. Uh, it was still very poor, nobody had anything to eat. And we went into the hotel and what did we see? A lot of Manchus walking around in Manchu kias. These were the actors and so on. I thought, what is this? This is completely weird. Um, and I even then began to think there is more uh, that's to the Qing. It's not simply put into the past, as most Chinese historians said at the time, um, then uh, we may have been led to believe. Um, just to be precise, the Qing dynasty officially ended on 12 February 1912 through an abdication, so very peaceful. It was welcomed at the time as, uh, you know, China being the first republic, uh, in Asia, and therefore it would simply prosper. And of course, 20th century history, the 20th century history of China has shown anything but. Uh, it's been a history of civil war, uh, warlord fighting, of hunger, of fights with Japan, of struggles for uh, freedom from various occupying forces. Um, and it's, it's even now, I don't think, actually arrived at a settled vision of its own past at all. But though, so the question really is, what did the Qing or China, the, her the heritage of China's bureaucratic empire leave behind? And there's a difference between saying the Qing and the history of empire in China. I'll come back to that in a minute. I think the first really important thing to note is that ch the Chinese script based on Chinese characters 
which can be pronounced differently across a vast territory, is something that is absolutely important to understand about China's past and about China today. The script was first unified by the first emperor, Jin uh, Shuangdi, the first emperor of the Qin in, in the second century BC. So the script, the language, the written language and power, the power of the dynasty of the empire has always been very closely intertwined. There have been times in the 20th century that uh, politicians, including Mao, actually try to abolish it and shift to an alphabetic form of writing Chinese. Um, and there's no reason why that isn't possible, given the Chinese language, given that 95% of the population for most of Chinese history simply spoke the language without actually knowing the characters were illiterate. So, but the script remains. And there's something called even character fetishism in China. It's something uniquely, uniquely Chinese and therefore East Asian, because Japan shares those. They've been in Korea, they've been in Vietnam. Um, and I think that remains absolutely critical to understanding why China remains a unified empire. You know, so the weight of learning of history, of a way of communication that is so different from that of, of Europe and the rest of the world, even from the Middle East. I think that's absolutely critical. I'm reminded here of one of the best pieces of art I've ever seen by a person named Xi Ping, who spent the Cultural Revolution inventing 5,000 characters. They looked like Chinese characters. They smelled like Chinese characters. They were printed like Chinese characters but they were meaningless. And just doing that is so difficult because, you know, there are 80,000 characters as it is. And of course, that was, an, an, uh, he did it during the Cultural Revolution. He became a big guy. He's one of the most famous artists of China. And as a way of saying, he displayed it, they're saying, well, these characters, what do they really mean? What does our language mean? What does it convey? Does it convey anything? Isn't there an emptiness there? Or is it even a prison? I think that's what he was trying to say. So characters is absolutely crucial. That's a legacy from the past, not going to go away. I think the other major legacy is that of territory. When you look at a map of China in the Ming Dynasty, 14th to 16th century, it is half of what China is today. In the 8th century, the Tibetan Empire was at least as large as the official Chinese empire, the Tang Dynasty. And in fact, the Tibetan Empire defeated the Tang Dynasty several times. During the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty, the one that abdicated in 1912, the Manchus had conquered vast places of Manchuria, Siberia, Mongolia, uh, Central Asia, including Xinjiang and Tibet and so on. And after 1912, there was some discussion of, well, so where do we say China is? What do, how do we define China territorial? And very quickly they said, we take the lot. And of course, that remains a huge issue today as sort of a heritage that President Xi Jinping believes he has to actually fulfill. This is the destiny of history of the new China to reconquer all those areas that the dynastic past has left to China. He's talking about Hong Kong and of course, Taiwan. There are parts of Siberia he could talk about as well. And some people have done, uh, but it, those people who have done this have been quickly reined in. Uh, they don't want to go there. But I think that perhaps even more significantly are some constitutional ideas about how to do politics, con real constitutional ideas about how the state is organized, what power means, who exercises it, and what derives from this. And there's one example of this is that authority, ultimate authority in China is unified and it is not transparent. An idea of sort of a division of power, a transparent politics that can be talked about does not exist. Didn't exist in dynastic times. It clearly doesn't exist today. Nobody knows what's going on in the inner circles of Beijing, you're not meant to know it. It is how power is done. Uh, and there's been no sign of serious sign of any of that changing. 
but empire has always has also left a whole set of very difficult legacies in some ways you can say sort of after empire we move to the nation state nation state and we sort of create this nation yet in the chinese case that is actually very difficult because it is a very diverse place with many what beijing prefers to call minorities many languages many ethnicities many cultures many religions so defining what this china now is the chinese nation is is actually very very complicated and if up until the let's say the death of mao the past was said to be it's all feudal it's all the past we're moving to something new from the 1980s chinese history came back so it was a questioning a new questioning of that history just one question was so the Qing dynasty, is that actually a Manchu dynasty or a Chinese dynasty? Those who argue it is a Manchu dynasty are in deep trouble in China and foreigners who do so, or the ones who have made that case are not allowed to go to China. There's also the Mongol dynasty, which of course also was an alien dynasty that somehow had to be domesticated. There have been great scholarship by one of the greatest historians of 20th century China, Chen Yinche, showing that the Tang dynasty was an amalgam of Chinese, but also Central Asian aristocracies in which women played a great role. He wrote this in the, in the 1950s. So he's way ahead of his time. So to pass this back, more recently, one of our colleagues at uh, Fudan University, Ge Jiaoguang, wrote a book called um, What is China? Same, same question. What is China? Where is China? Where might it be? How do we define this China? What is this China's view of the international order? All kinds of questions that are, of course, becoming more and more important as China is becoming more and more important. We can no longer ignore them, uh, but there are there's enormous debate going on, sort of behind the silences that we might see in the press. There's enormous debate going on within China about these uh, issues, complicated because if for a long time Beijing was seen to speak for China, we have now many other parts of the world that are speaking for China, such as, of course, Taiwan, Singapore. You know, if, if the question is, who is China, where is China, then it's also Amer Chinese Americans in America might be speaking on behalf of China. There are versions of that of answers to that, for instance, by this Confucian sage, Du Weiming, uh, who was one of my teachers, who included people like me as Chinese, who were able, permitted to contribute to the discussion. So no easy, uh, easy answers there. Uh, and many, I think many debates to go on, uh, and many questions to, to further ponder. Uh, which I am terribly excited about as we pursue this quest to a more global form of genuine humanities discussion. So thank you. Uh, I think I'll hand you back to Elizabeth, who will feed us questions. Is that right, Beth? That's right. Thank you so much, Hans, um, Shruti and Ezra. That was wonderful. And yes, please do share your questions for our speakers in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have. I'm actually going to start, Hans, with a question for you because it leads on very nicely from the end of your, your talk. Um, and this is from Tom. He says that he's just read a piece in The Economist about how the Xi regime is rehabilitating the Qing dynasty for its own reasons, creating a definite spin on that. Do you have any comment on that? Is rehabilitating the Qing dynasty for, can, can you repeat that? Of course. Sorry, it's rehabilitating the Qing dynasty for its own reasons, so the current regime and creating a definite spin on that. Is there any, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's simple. It just has to do with legitimacy. And in China, legitimacy is seen as um, you are a successor regime. Uh, uh, asserted legitimacy by writing the history of the previous regime. So all dynasties in the past, it was the, the you know, the succeeding dynasty wrote about uh, the previous dynasty, usually as a beginning that was great, and then 
uh, the moral strings goes away. It is horrible stuff and therefore taking over as legitimate. So for Xi Jinping to be seen as legitimate, he has to describe himself as fitting into that whole dynastic history that goes all the way back to the first emperor, 200 BC, run through time, then the Qing abdication, then the Republic of, Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek, and then Xi Jinping. And he has set up, China has set up vast historical uh, research programs trying to make that case. Um, I think that would be one sense. The other sense that he would he would probably uh, articulate is that the Qing dynasty uh, achieved uh, its own breakthrough to rational economics and science on its own. Uh, there are cases to be made like that. I think they're fairly dubious, but you know, there is there is there is a lot of critical thinking going on uh, philosophically in 17th and 18th century China that you could see as sort of a proto-scientific enlightenment kind of story. So he can pick that up as underscoring sort of China's own move to science. Uh, there's much more to be said, but let me leave it at that. Right. So we'll move on with a question for all our um, speakers, which is from Daniel, who asks, should we really judge historical events by modern 21st century values? So I might throw that to the floor um, for you, maybe in the order in which you spoke for us. So shall we start with you, Ezra? Yes, yeah, so obviously, right, the historians call this pre presentism. Um, we, we cannot judge, really. Uh, but at the same time, especially for empires who had fallen recently, it really has consequences for today. You know, some people really suffered, some people really benefited. What are we going to do? Are we going to just forget about some of the things and say, oh, well, it was 100 years ago? Or are we going to um, hold the people who are um, today's beneficiaries accountable? and possibly pay reparations, right? So this is also another question. Thank you. Um, so to follow from that, um, yes, I mean, all histories tend to be histories of the present. Uh, and of course, what historians do, which is not what politicians do or say non-professionals do, is look at the evidence and then mount arguments about the past. So in some senses, while history does form everyone's identity, and whether we look at India today, or even China, or elsewhere, and certainly Britain, history has really animated the political sphere. So this, it's very hard to separate the two things, and it's not very possible. The question about the empire in the way you have uh, posited, the question is posited, leads to this question, what historians call, what kind of reckoning are we looking for uh, in the public sphere, not just in, as it were, uh, private identities or public identities, but what should now be the, uh, the, 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 the conversation around empire, around, as it were, British identity, but also responsibility. And the question of reparation, I just want to make this point, is, a, is actually a very controversial one and is always seen in terms of money. But I'm actually, you know, you know, a, a kind of a, someone who inherited the legacy of uh, people like Nehru and people like Gandhi, who in a way overthrew the British Empire. And one of the things that somehow someone like uh, Gandhi said was that you can never force someone to make an apology. And this is really at the heart of the problem with, uh, with empire, whether it is the Amritsar massacre, whether it is the question of how much does, as it were, what is the question economic relationship between say what happened to Britain and what happened to India, for example, or Africa in the last uh, 300 years. And I always tend to, as a per as in personally, tend to be on the ethical side of things. And I think what I, like Gandhi, would actually like a genuine reckoning, a genuine apology, a genuine apology in the sense for, in fact, yes, the mass deaths that occurred uh, under the insignia of the empire. Um, and these are, you know, running debates. These are running debates around museums, who owns this heritage uh, and the like. But when we say these things, we should never forget that what is also animating them is hyper-nationalism. 
that this is the age in which we also now are becoming identitarian uh, because there's a rise of neo-nationalism everywhere. And I just want to conclude by saying something that actually uh, Hans was alluding to about mixture and, 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 and the mixed heritage with which even modern China uh, is born with. And that is exactly the story with something like, like India and South Asia, you know, not just the multiplicity of religions, but languages, regions. So in that sense, Indian nationality was very different from European nationality. European nationality was formed on the basis of one language, one race, perhaps even one religion. And that was not the story with India. But that is also now those sorts of mixed legacies are in some ways under pressure across the world. Right, it's a great question. Thank you for that. I, mean, I think one of the obvious comments to make is, first of all, is you know there are a lot of different kinds of 20th century uh, standards. That's one thing, uh, and you know. That's, but I, the real point I wanted to make is that in these discussions about em empire in East and Southeast Asia, um, one of the well, it's one of the things that I'm researching now. But the Japanese empire is very important. Uh, of course, it occupied vast spaces in East Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, a hugely populous country. And the whole discussion about apologies or the, you know, Ch modern Chinese nationalism is almost defined as uh, anti-Japanese. Uh, and it is a deeply political problem. And that there, the history of apology is uh, it, it, it keeps going on, becoming very, very, very difficult. There's the Yasukuni Shrine issue, uh, where Japanese prime ministers, I mean, the Yasukuni Shrine is where Chinese, uh, Japanese soldiers, uh, more leaders were buried, including those condemned by, condemned by the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. You know, that whole so it is, it is a really important issue to get a handle on if you want to understand, begin to understand, uh, East Asia very broadly conceived, East Asian relations. Uh, today, uh, and in many ways, you know, my own take is that in many ways Japan has always opposed. At the same time, there is a right-wing faction in the, in Japan uh, that keeps denying uh, some of what has happened, and much of what happened was was terrible uh, in terms of bombing, in terms of using uh, gas as a weapon of war, inc including including using hunger. Uh, as, as a weapon, it was a deeply violent history. What was done to women was terrible. Um, and there are reparations. Uh, some, some Koreans and some Indonesians uh, have tried to make uh, demands for reparations. So it gets a very complicated issue. So we can see that particular issue as sort of fitting into a European empire model. That's important. The, com the complexities when you take in Japanese imperialism, that was an act that was de definitely an act against European imperialism. Uh, it gets even more complicated and therefore even more interesting. Uh, not easy at all. Thank you so much, Paul. I think that leads really nicely into um, another question, which again, I'd like to throw open to you all, um, which is from Nigel, which is, is having been an imperial power a benefit or a burden? or in fact, just irrelevant. <laughs> and Hans, I don't want to make you speak again, but should we go back in reverse order this time? Thank you. Did you want me to go first? Or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Empire's benefit. Um, gosh. Um, I think in the case of Holland, it's been a huge benefit economically. Mm -hmm. uh, they really knew how to gain all the wealth and build up vast industries and amass capital and then invest it all over the place. Uh, if you just walk around Holland, uh, the beautiful cities they have, it's only possible uh, because of the empire they had. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of the economic relations of Britain towards its empire uh, were a bit more difficult and, you know, this economic historians keep going back and forth, but let me just walk around Holland. You see the kinds of cities, first East India Company and then the Dutch state build up, the wealth it acquired um, and the wealth it then, in fact, the capital from nation that has kept, you know, been very good at, at hanging on to. Uh, so, you know, um, 
I, I think there's been, in that sense, a huge benefit. Um, there are also benefits, probably, intellectually. And so the economic side is one thing. The other side is the building up of knowledge bases that do know about the rest of the world, of personal connections around the world, um, which actually might be very useful. Um, you know, it's a, it, you know there are lots of people have engaged in different ways with the areas that were colonized and have sustained human relations. And I, I, that in the case of Holland, it keeps coming back to actually sometimes, uh, you know, and that's clearly a decent relations with Indonesia. It's clearly important in the British case, uh, especially important in British India relations. Um, I know much less about the Middle East, but there too, uh, I think there are sort of, you know, it's, it's common histories, but common networks. Uh, that uh, have been built up and that do sustain themselves over time, I think. Um, so there. Yeah. So I would say that it's inextricable. You cannot now unpick this history because, you know, the history of modern Britain, the last 300 years is really the history of the empire overseas and then that returning back to Britain. And likewise, I think uh, where India is today, in large part, I mean, speaking in English, I grew up in India, but in English is pretty much my first language. It's not just about cricket and tea, but the very fact that my mother tongue is, is equally English, uh, uh, apart from my you know, other languages that I know. So you can't undo empire. Uh, are they, but I do want to sort of spend half a minute saying that are they relevant? And I would like to say that at least for my generation, when I mean, you know, growing up in India, but also seeing the story of democracy and then coming and teaching in Britain, particularly in the current last few years, and I was in America during the, the Gulf War, the empire story returns when you have big international uh, remaking. So I actually think the reason we are talking about empires is not simply because of local identities, but I also think the world map, the world of geopolitical order is changing. And therefore, you know, China is center stage. Why are we listening to Qing history? Because, it, you know, it has become incredibly important for us to know where, how, China, how, how Chinese uh, ideas of politics and power, you know, how do they think about it? So I think, in that sense, uh, to some extent, I would say Britain has done rather well to punch above, you know, its weight in the world order, given that its empire has been dead 70 years on. But it is also a testament to its imperial legacy that it has held on to the top table precisely because of that empire. So I think these are interesting times where we to have this same discussion with the same panelists or the same kind of expertise in 10 years, I think we will be talking about slightly different things. My money, my money would be that we would be focusing much more on China-Japan relations. What does the Pacific look like? What is the Indian story? Has it collapsed? Has it become big? Uh, and does Europe look a bit smaller? Is it just one big, smaller player, uh, you know, as opposed to the way it has really, uh, you know, over you know, it, it really has cast a very big shadow on the modern world, uh, and I think that's being undone, and that's that's what we are witnessing. Yeah, I would say similar things. Uh, being the one who conquers is, of course, easier um, than the one who is being conquered. You know, the one who is extracting is easier than the one who is giving all the resources. Um, also, we can look into the future, then what happens when the empire falls. If we look at the Ottoman Empire, of course, into the nation states, the Sunni Turkish Muslims ended up being the beneficiaries, you know, even though it was not the empire anymore, the one, the group who mostly held the power at the center, continue holding it into, you know, as a nation state has been um, made. You know, so that not all Turks and not all Muslims at all were benefiting from the, um, uh, you know, resources that are being extracted. You know, obviously lots of uh, Turkish Muslim peasants um, were not benefiting. But as the nation state was formed, the, the ones who were closest to the power center ended up benefiting from what the empire has accumulated.
Ezra, if I could just come back to you um, for another question, which is from Michael, who asks, many current conflicts originated in lands of the Ottoman Empire. How do you, you think Western governments understand the history of these disputes? Yeah, so, uh, some of the um, Turkish leaders would like to think that, oh, you know, all, all these, uh, none of these conflicts existed during the Ottomans. The Ottomans were uh, leading the, the region really well and that the nationalism made things complicated. One can argue for uh, some of that. Also, a lot of conflicts actually were um, caused by the the way in which the British ruled, as Shruti was saying, when the British Empire left in all areas, all these um, conflicts also came into being. Um, yeah, so I would I would think that a lot of the conflicts are more recent than they are more 100, 200 years old than 600 years old. Thank you, Ezra. <laughs> That's really great. I'm afraid I think we've almost run out of time, so I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, um, and we really hope you've enjoyed the session, um, watching the session as much as we've enjoyed delivering it, and um, thank you again. <laughs>